What's up, everyone? Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night Pre-Party with Sadie LaFlem Snow. Hello. I'm so happy to have you in Thank here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. So we've got a lot to cover today. I have, a, I have a long list of questions for you. But first on Ladies Night, we play Dicey Questions. Okay. So you're going to get three rolls on this dice tower, mm -hmm. and each number corresponds to a random question I have. And whatever you roll for yourself, that is where we start. Okay. All right. First roll up. No, no, don't do it. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I'm terrible at this. Wait, is, is this something I should know how to do already? I mean, honestly, I didn't really know what a dice tower was until I started doing it on this show, but I can't. I, there's like a lot of people who just well, roll it on the table. You every day. Here we go. All right. We're seven. kicking it off with a seven. You rolled one of my favorite questions first. This question is Scream. It can only be one question. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, my favorite scary movie... Uh, Carrie. <laughs> Ooh, solid choice right there. I like that. Is that the scariest movie you've ever seen or just your favorite? No, I think it's my favorite and I also have quite a limited scary movie. I'm I'm pretty like, I'm pretty easily spooked. So I'm not really a scary movie girl in general, okay. but I, I love like the killer prom queen concept. It's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it's a, it's a trope that out there and it's kind of cool. Okay, okay. I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to whip up a recommendation. I feel like you need to see, also because it's coming out this weekend, see Lisa Frankenstein. Okay, It's yeah. got like a little bit of those vibes, uh, like Heather's Edward Scissorhands. Yes, and it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good time. It's a good time. I love that. Okay, I'll absolutely go check it out. All right. Second roll in the tower. Okay. Now I'm a pro at this. Yes. <laughs> All right. We have an eight. Eight is movie and TV skills. If you could learn a new skill or about a different profession through a role, what would you pick and why? Well, Kyler and Andy really want me to learn to ride a horse. Ooh. That's their pick for me. But my pick for myself um, would probably be... Oh, that's hard. I think maybe... Oh my gosh, this is a hard question. It, it can be. I always stumped. think I want to like... I don't know, learn a language, but I, I feel oh, like that's... I'm not really good at learning languages, so I'm afraid <laughs> there would be some sort of mental block and then I wouldn't be able to do my job. Well, I uh, one time I was cast in a project that originally the actor, the, the character had a British accent and I was really excited um, because I went to theater school. We like studied accents. It was like, it was, do not ask me to do this. <laughs> Um, no, but I was so excited because I was like, this is going to this is going to be the thing that's like going to push me to be get really like comfortable with an accent and then and then it got changed then I got changed to being American and I was like oh sad I'm so. impressed by anyone who can do an accent too that's something where just like like my mouth does not know how <laughs> to make sounds that way I can't retrain my brain to do that do you want me to sub in a different question because what you're just talking about made me think of this okay yeah so this is my would you rather question okay I'm curious to know your answer would you rather have to fake sneeze or fake vomit in the scene Oh, fake vomiting is kind of funny. Okay. I like, <laughs> I've, I've had to do it before and it's, I don't know, it's kind of like the shock factor is just okay. satisfying. <laughs> I feel like most people pick fake sneeze because fake vomit is gross. And oh, it's then I disgusting. And I have to be like, can but you fake sneeze? Because that's like a, a an everyday thing that feels really hard to replicate. Let's see if I can fake sneeze. It's <laughs> no, that was horrible. No, that was <laughs> That, I'm, I'm so impressed. I need to one day cut a montage of all the wonderful fake sneezes that I recorded on this show because very impressed right there. That was kind of like you're holding in a sneeze and then you like. <laughs> that, is, that is a type of sneeze. All right. You have one more roll in the tower. Okay, here we go. All right. We're closing this out with a number four. This is one of my uh, my the way home questions. I, okay. I just like cleverly call this the pond. <laughs> if you jumped into the pond. Mm -hmm. Where would it take you and why would it take you there? Well, the pond takes you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. So where do I need to go? I need to go back to the 90s, similarly to Alice, so that I can steal my mom's wardrobe from the 90s so that I can have all her clothes because she had really cool clothes. And every time I put on an outfit that I feel is cool, she's like, ah, I had all those things. I can't believe you spent money on that. I should have kept them. <laughs> That's a really good answer. <laughs> the only answer I could think of was I need to go far enough back in time when 
te- like all of this doesn't exist. Oh, so yeah, I that could would remind myself peaceful. what it was like to function without it. I would love to do that, too. Yeah, I think that would do something to my spirit. <laughs> I wouldn't love to do it, but I think something in this world needs to force me to do it. Yes. OK. Yeah, love fair enough. Stuff too much. It's a problem. It's a problem. <laughs> All right. Here's the meat of our conversation now. Every single ladies night begins with this question. What is the movie you saw, the performance you saw, personal experience you had, you name it, that first made you say to yourself, I absolutely have to be an actor? I feel like that was probably... <laughs> Like something in the theater when I was really, really little. But maybe more recently, in terms of like on screen acting, was Michaela Cole's Chewing Gum. I love that show. She's so funny. It started as a play and then became a series. Of, and, and it just like it changed my brain. I, I love that show so much. I think she's a genius. Huh. <laughs> good, good, good uh, plug right there. I like that one. <laughs> Um, next step for you is I want to talk about studying your craft at school because National Theater School of Canada, two questions about that. First is what is something you learn while studying there that you still find yourself using today? Mm-hmm. But then I also want to know something that all the schooling in the world never would have prepared you for when you hit your first <laughs> professional set. Okay. Um, something I learned that I still use all the time. Um, it's probably just like the how similar acting is to like doing imaginary play like when you're a little kid and that's I feel like so often how how so many people get into acting is like you're a really imaginative little kid and you just just kind of like never stops and I think like when you're in school they try and draw that connection so you don't like (laughs) lose hope and like get too tired and out of it to be able to continue on but it it's something that like I'm reminded of all the time our sets on our show are so beautiful and I feel like it's like it's it's just like you're like in a giant dollhouse and you're just like living out that dream. That's such a pure answer. I love that. <laughs> and then uh, something that I could not have been taught. Huh. Uh, don't take yourself so seriously. School is so serious. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think I also brought a certain serious energy to school that I think when it when you're working and then you realize it's a job and it's a gift. It, you kind of have to just like let it go a little bit more. And sometimes it's like you you just have to like you're not you don't maybe feel ready or you you're having a, an off day or something, but you just have to kind of get after it because you that's the job that you're here to do. And I think in school you kind of get into like, oh, it wasn't my best. You know what I mean? But once it becomes a job, you're like, OK, here huh. I am. And so it's been nice to kind of learn that a little bit. It's hard to actually do, but here I am saying it. So <laughs> I'll when try and put it into practice even I mean, more. <laughs> I feel like no, no matter your craft, no matter your job, that's an important thing to keep in mind always. Adding to that a little bit, whether it's on the way home set or anything you've worked on, can you recall a time where you just had to say to yourself, like, take a breath, be free, take some risks. And because you did that, some of the work wound up being better off for it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think all of the pawn stuff is so... It, like you can't really plan for it because it's just you versus the real pond. And so you kind of you don't have a mark. You can't open your eyes underwater. You don't really even like they call action and then you go under. So you're the boss of when the scene starts. So it's kind of like this thing of it doesn't even feel like a- acting. You're kind of just you're so involved in the choreography of the pond and making sure everything's safe and everything's you're doing the like, you know, you're, it's like a dance with what you know, whatever I, the other aspects going on, and um, so it's good to just shake it up and, and do that. Of all the emotional scenes you have to do in this show, it's going into and out of the <laughs> pond that stresses me out the most. It's like I love to swim, but I love the act of swimming, making myself go into the pool, and also feeling the cold when I get out is literally the worst thing in the world. So I yeah. can't even imagine doing that as many times as you must. <laughs> it's pretty fun. I mean. It's it's fun in terms of it's a bucket list thing to be able to do that. I mean, do do that kind of work and do something that is kind of not your regular like studio set sort of scenes. Um, and yeah, it's just like you know, you know, right before I booked the role, I got a text from my agent being like, "Can you swim?" I was like, "Yeah, I can swim. Like, I can. Sw- <laughs> yeah, of course." And then I didn't realize how important that aspect would be so i'm i sure i'm glad i can swim because (laughs) i love i love being able to do this and if that 
that's what it takes, then I'll swim all over the place. <laughs> I have many questions about booking this role. But first, I kind of want to backtrack a little bit because I feel like there are so many people in this industry who, you know, study at school and then have to wait years and years to book their first big role on a TV show. It happened really fast for you. So other <laughs> than the fact that, you know, you're you're just talented and you deserve it. What do you credit with making it happen so quickly? Was like they're the right person in your corner? Did the audition come your way in just the right way in time? What was it? I think, I mean, I have an amazing team who could see that part um, come in and like from a mile away. We're like, I saw this thing and I think you're really going to like it. And I think I just when I read it, I just like saw you. And it was funny because I feel like you hear that. And then sometimes the audition comes through and you're like, Oh, that really? That's what you saw me like. But then a lot. It was just that thing of like I. I read the scene and I. I was like, oh no, that. I just have a feeling that this is something that I'm going to connect to. And even like when I did the scene, it, there was one part where, I turn to Jacob and I say like, um, you know, you look after yourself, okay? And my my friend who I was reading with was like. I think you're just doing a little too much with that line. And I was like, no, no, no. I think I think something really bad is going to happen to this little boy. And she was like, I, I think you're just telling him to look after himself. <laughs> I don't think it's that deep. And I'm like, no, I have this feeling. And then finding out um, when I was getting like a recall and that sort of thing that that I had the intuition, like there was yeah. kind of like a weird feeling of like, oh, I, I just feel like I knew that. And I I don't know. It you was kind of a beautiful it. story. It was meant to be. I feel like I have a good follow up to that. But I want to squeeze in this particular uh, question first, just because you brought up the idea of having a good team at your back. And I feel like that's something that we don't talk about in this industry nearly enough. I'm assuming you're meaning like agents and managers, that kind of team. When you find the right people to work with in that respect, what do you look for in them that signals to you they aren't just going to support me in being successful in this industry, but they're going to support like my deepest dreams and passions and advocate for the roles I really want to do? Well, I think, you know, I I came into like the on-screen like film and television world pretty green in that I trained in theater and I really mm -hmm. approached like building a team by looking for people who took me seriously and at the same time were like ready to to like answer all my kind of <laughs> out there questions because I think there's a lot of assuming that you know what's going on and it but it's good to be like I this might be a dumb question and have everyone receiving you with like that is not a dumb question and there's so much to learn um and I just feel like very supported by the people that have you know, I love that yeah I ask that all know. the time I always ask I always ask people for seemingly silly questions about what it takes to make a movie or a show that they wish more newer actors would have the courage to ask early on. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular thing you would point out, like say to a, an up and coming actor, like, don't be afraid to question that ask? Oh, OK. Um, that's OK. That's tough because I feel like I'm still like. I, I feel like I'm no expert, but <laughs> you, uh, you I learn think, every step of the way. That's the important part. I think maybe it's just that it's OK to ask and it's like it's better to ask than to it's better to ask and then feel comfortable and do a good job. Um, because half the battle, I feel like for me with season one was like getting comfortable, even just being on a set and mm -hmm. like having that level of responsibility. And so season two, I feel like it, it flew by in a way that I was like, oh, my God what what was different it was like oh I felt really at home and so I think like even if you're there for a day or a couple of days like it's okay to it's okay to ask because ultimately it leads to probably doing a better scene which is really what you're there to do and I mean you're also there to be like nice and generous in the workplace and all this Always. but like at the same time like <laughs> just ask um I feel like I do better when I'm not my brain's not like distracted mm -hmm. by those kinds of things and I think we th we think we're like you know, doing a good job and like behaving well by like keeping to ourselves and not asking. But, you know, I think it's always better to ask. It's so true. <laughs> That's why I ask that question all the time. I have so many follow up questions. One more I wanted to ask about the audition experience. When you go into that audition, I don't know how with what clarity you remember this still, mm -hmm. but what were some of your priorities in terms of like nailing the scenes you were given but also doing something to, I guess, make the role your own at that point so that you stand out from the pack. Yeah, I mean, I think I think just having that immediate connection to the scenes right away made me think that I, 
I didn't feel like I had to like layer on an extra level of like, and just in case you were looking for something <laughs> like you weren't, you know what I mean? In case I, in case you were looking for something like different, I'm like, I just felt like it was almost like revealing who I was at 16 or like, it, that's kind of what it felt like in a way. And I, I, I think like we even had to sing in the audition in the scene a cappella. And oh my God, I'm starting to sweat just so thinking like about that. So like picking a song was really vulnerable and stuff too. And just like the idea of like, so it's the scene from episode two, I think, where Alice is in the kitchen singing with Colton. Mm-hmm. And so it's like really tender moment. And to have to pick a song that encapsulates that and they didn't put one in the in the audi- <laughs> like That's in the so scene. Cool. So you're kind of like, okay, well here here goes nothing. And so um it was just like I guess being comfortable with being that vulnerable and uh, in the world of self tapes, vulnerability feels like even weirder because you're just like putting it out. You're like, here's my Wii transfer. Please enjoy my <laughs> soul. <laughs> that um, is what it is. <laughs> but it's you know, I think that that's the that's the beautiful part is like when you have a connection to it, you're not kind of like digging for something mm-hmm. vulnerable. It's like it feels kind of like right below the surface. So, mm-hmm. yeah. You are also such a good singer. Oh, every thank time, you. Every time you sing in the show, I'm like, yes, more, please. Thank you. Um, so moving through the process a little more now, you book the role. I always love hearing about how things evolve along the way. What would you say is the biggest difference between how you first planned to play Alice when you first booked the role and mm-hmm. who she became the more and more you dug into the character yourself and then also with your scene partners? Yeah. Um, when, when you first meet Alice, she's like really that quintessential like bratty teenager with her parents going through divorce and she wears a lot of eyeliner and like stomps around in her Doc Martens and it's like really mean to her family (laughs) but I think you know she she really has changed when the time travel like concept is introduced and she's she like really softens and so kind of trying to like have that not be like you know an instant switch but that you see this person who like wants to be that version of herself um and kind of how can she open up like that in the present to her mom and to her grandmother? And I think with season two, we see that person as kind of like her starting point. And so now I think there's even more room to play like what happens when that person like gets kind of ugly and like what happens when she's like really, really like actually lets you in and lets you see her be like happy and excited. And like anyway, so it's I I think there's a lot to to go with her this season. I always love when I'm talking to someone and they explain something in a way where I could be like, like, yes, I felt it that way. I felt it that way. I'm so glad. (laughs) Job very well done. (laughs) Looking back on season one, is there any particular scene that you could think of that really helped you put Alice into focus where no matter how far away you get from that scene, you can kind of always refer back to that as like an anchor or grounding mechanism for her? Yeah, there is a scene in in season one where... Alice comes out um, onto the farm and she see, she's being led by the teenage version of her mom and you look up and you see teen Elliot and then she turns and her grandfather, who she never gets to meet in the present day, comes up to her and introduces himself and we shot it and it was like golden hour and finally, you know, I had spent time with Kyler and Evan who play the adult versions of um, Kat and Elliot, but the the picture, this like 90s nostalgic picture all kind of came together while we were shooting that scene. And I don't have any lines. Like, I think all I say is like, I'm Alice or like something. I don't know. And and I I just I felt like I was I was like, I felt like I was in a movie. You were in a movie. But <laughs> um, it was it's something that when I think about what's the what's at the core of this show is like there's kind of the magic element of the pond, but it's really the family and the magic meeting that makes it so exciting and so for like that scene for me is the family piece and the magic meeting and being um something that really represents the show for me so true a a cool high concept is only as strong as the characters that are interacting with it. And I feel like this show is a prime example of that. Thank you. So you brought up earlier getting on this set and maybe like being a little nervous about being on (laughs) your first big set. Yes. You do have two very experienced, exceptional actors working alongside you as scene partners and also executive producers on the show and Mm -hmm. Andy and Kyler. What is something about the way that they operated as leaders on set that you really appreciated and maybe you'll even back pocket and apply to 
the many other lead roles you're going to have in films and shows in the future. I feel like the thing that is so, so similar about the way that Kyler and Andy approach being leaders on a set like this is that how much they love the project and love their characters and will fight for the story and the integrity of the story and the creative process is so clear to everybody on the set that it kind of sets a tone of like, okay, this is how much we're caring about this project. And so I think it makes everyone want to bring their A game, whether you're there for one day, whether you're working as a daily on the crew, whether you're like people just have, you know, you look to the leaders and it's these guys who are showing like that, how much they love the show and how much they love the story. And it's like, it's infectious Mm -hmm. in the best way. And I, I think that it's just, it's a beautiful way to lead a set. And I really, I really appreciate it. Trickle down effect is so real. It's so real. (laughs) That's making me think of another question that I ask a lot because I love the thought of, you know, people on sets finding their voice in a sense, like realizing that if something doesn't feel quite right, they can speak up and change Mm -hmm. it for the better. So is there any example in either season of a time when like something didn't feel quite right? You knew that you had to voice your thoughts on the matter and a scene is better off for it. I think with the the pawn stuff, it's kind of a big it's kind of a big undertaking. It's hold. It's like, you know, there's a bit of danger, like real danger. And then in the scene, they're usually, it's pre- usually pretty high emotion. And um, I think a lot of that, Kyler and I shoot together and she's really a pro with the stunt stuff. You know, she's done a lot of it herself. And so I feel like I look to her a lot for guidance in those moments of like, are we actually ready to shoot this? I actually need another minute because... We move fast, and but at the end of the day, it's about doing it safely. And because there's no there's no reason to get a bad take of something that you did, and then some like something bad happened. So I think like I've also found my voice in watching her take a leadership role, and especially in those moments. Um, and I try and with with the especially you know there's kind of like the teenage cast. We're all adults, but we play teenagers. Um, I try and, you know, you know, like um, Andy and Kyler have really they really lead our little family of women. And I feel like when it's, you know, I love our our teen cast. And I feel like when we're together, I try and extend that level of like care and if I can in any way. And so, you know, I mean, I can't spoil anything, but there's (laughs) there's moments down the line where these kinds of like stunt and safety things come up and I feel like I was trying to channel my inner Kyler in those moments. Okay. I'll, t- I'll leave it. Like, I'll take all the good vibes <laughs> that answer exudes and also the tease that I just got there. Okay, good. <laughs> Le- leaning into season two a little more heavily now, two-part question about taking Alice into season two. Can you tell me a quality she had in season one that you knew you wanted to still hold tight to and make sure was very, very present in her? But then I also want to know a new quality you found in season two that you were excited to tap into for the first time. Um, season one, I think I would say that she was really persistent. Like she really had a mission and she was going to go after it. And I think that, um, I, I always want to have that. I think that she's at the end of the day, she wants her family to heal and she wants. And so in a way that's different than Kat, maybe, cause she really wants to, like, she wants to find the answer about like where is Jacob and I think even Alice is starting to be like we need to heal we like that is not necessarily going to heal us um and then and then I think the new side of things for Alice is maybe kind of like more of a nurturing side like she has to grow up her grandmother needs her I think the stuff between Alice and Del this season she finds this responsibility to to take care of people in her family in a way that's not like, you know, jumping in a pond and finding answers about like why, you know, a child went missing or someone got in a car crash, but rather being there for them in the present and like actually, and and for her mom too, her her mom, sorry, that's very, I have to say it the American way. Her mom, (laughs) um, her mom uh, is really there for her. And I think she kind of needs to like be there in the same way. 
Oh, I love that. I love I love how I should probably <laughs> say I've watched uh, through episode six. I love what what a rock she's become to, yeah. to the women in her life. I feel like that's a really special quality to see in such a young character. And mm-hmm. the fact that it's earned to makes it really special and probably important for a lot of young people out there to see. Yeah. And she kind of grows into it. It's not like sh- she doesn't you don't really go, oh, she's an old soul. When you meet her, you go, this girl is intense. She's courageous. She's kind of impulsive. She's emotional. And then she matures into this nurturing role and this caring role in her family that we didn't know about her at the beginning. So here's where I get a little dangerous. So I want I want to <laughs> tease what's left in the rest of the season. Okay. So I know we got to avoid spoilers, but we we're, were just emphasizing, you know, like she's become like a little bit of a rock for the people in her life. And it does make me curious can can anything or maybe what could rattle that foundation in the remaining episodes? Are you able to tease mm-hmm. anything in that respect? <laughs> well, I think at the end of season one, she's told that she can't go back to see her mom and Elliot um, in the past. And then very quickly at the beginning of season two, she goes back to the past and she sees everyone that she had been told she'd never see again. So... The, the idea that there have been some secrets, that things may have been swept under the rug, that people still think maybe there's a chance, you know, that won't happen again, um, that they can kind of keep whatever that reason is from her, I think is something that could shake the foundation. There's, I think there's some unearthing that can happen that could that could make her question the adults in her life and their choices that they may have made as young people. Given the little seeds I have thus far, I would believe that to be true. I'll end with this one. (laughs) I'll I'll say, I don't know, give me like three words to answer this question. What do you think viewers' reaction to the season two finale is going to be? Oh my gosh. (laughs) I think that they will... I was so worried that you were just about to say, I think that is going to be your three words. Okay, wait, no. (laughs) I think they will say we want more. Oh, what a cop out, but (laughs) No, wait, but you said three words. I did, I did. I can give you more words if you want. (laughs) Clearly, I'm chatty. I'll take that. I'll take that. Sadie, I'm going to say thank you for your time today. Thank you. Congratulations on everything you've accomplished in the past, on the way home, and everything coming your way in the future. Truly a special performance in this show, and I have a feeling I'm going to be welcoming you back to Ladies Night in the near future. Thank you so much.